My guest today is Kristen Cedarquist. Kristen, how are you doing? Good, thank you very much. What do you do? I am a nanoparticle scientist in Lansing, Michigan. Nanoparticle scientist. That's like a rocket scientist, right? Well, I would like to believe so, but no. <laughs> I'm sorry. You did, a, you did a talk here at the Nerd Night on nanoparticles, and uh, I learned a lot that I didn't know. <laughs> Which is usually what I learn. Uh, let's... Uh, so what, let's define. Let's define some terms. Nanoparticles. What is that? So nanoparticles. You think of rocket science as being something on a very big scale. Um, nanoparticles are actually on a very small scale. Uh -huh. uh, so nanos, the prefix is actually Greek for dwarf. So okay. nanoparticles just are sort of dwarf particles, very small particles, on the order of around a billionth of a millimeter. So why do we care about nanoparticles? Why are they important to the world? In we care about nanoparticles because they're actually the future of building blocks. So you think of blocks as a kid, you, you take one piece and you can put it anywhere you want and then you can assemble sort of, you know, castles out of them, houses out of them. Um, we can do the same with nanoparticles, but on a, on a smaller scale we can't do houses or castles yet, but um, theoretically we could do devices, um, we could do... What do you mean devices? Well, devices as in electron transistors and things like that. So they're assembled out of these nanoparticles? Yes, you theoretically could. It, it, it's... Nanoparticles do what they want, but um, they are sort of these small building blocks with which we could assemble new electronic devices. You, you said they do what they want. That implies a certain randomness That's right. to the behavior of nanoparticles. Yes. So um, nanoparticles on a, on, on a big scale, if you think of a building block, you can do what you want with that block. You can put it anywhere you want, and it's, it's subject to, it sits where it wants to sit, where you put it because of friction. Nanoparticles, if you put them down, theoretically, um, then they would not necessarily sit there because they're, they're usually in solution. So they, they actually would not sit the way you want them to. Um, they're very responsive to things like um, salts, um, to things like the surrounding medium, to things like charge that are around them. So they actually can be quite finicky if you don't know how to control them. Uh, so you're controlling them not as an individual particle, you're controlling them as groups of particles? Is that the That's idea? right. We're, we're controlling them as a solution of particles right okay. now. We would love to be able to control single nanoparticles, and some groups are getting close. Okay. So we'll t describe some of the practical applications. So the practical applications of nanoparticles, there are a few. Um, one of them is in drug development. So if, if you can attach certain drugs to nanoparticles and then also attach a targeting um, part to the same nanoparticle, theoretically you could target a nanoparticle to a place that you want it and then release a drug selectively. So no, no more the swallowing drugs and just hoping they go to the right places, but then they go sort of everywhere, mostly in the place you want, but some in the place you don't. Um, this would be a targeting targeting technique right. to, to make them go where you, exactly where you want them to. Does that technology exist today? Is that technology what? Does that exist today? Um, it exists in theory, and, and, and a few... A few a few Gadonkin experiments and a few proof of concept principles. Um, and actually, in a few mice models as well. The mice are getting the medicine, but we're oh, not. Oh, they sure are. <laughs> yes, they are. All right, so I think that's I actually I have a degree in biochemistry. You probably didn't know that about me, but it was a long, long, long time. Um, and so I've forgotten a lot of it. But I remember this concept of receptors. Yes. And this sounds like you're talking about the same thing it here. Is. is. That proteins would bind to some receptors somewhere so because it was the right shape. That's right. So if you can put antibodies on the surface of nanoparticles, which we can do, um, then you could theoretically target these, these nanoparticle conjugates with antibodies on them to a certain antigen. So whatever the antibody is, is raised against, you could bind it to that. Uh, and, but there are some things actually in the commercial world right now where nanoparticles being, you, you mentioned some things, sunscreens, um, water repellent fabrics. Uh, yes. What's, uh, tell me some of the things that are out there right now that people are actually able to tap in the So the, the water repellent fabrics are called nanotex fabrics okay. and they, they've been marketed and, and called different things by a number of different companies. Um, but basically what they are is really hydrophobic coatings and that just means a lot of repelling. Uh -huh. So if, if you have nanoparticles that have really, really hydrophobic tendencies, and if you spread them around, well, that their high surface area means that water is really repelled from the surface of whatever you poke them on. Interesting. So the the fact that they're so small means that you can spread it out very thin, yeah, that's right. very, very that's wide, and have a very thin layer. That's yes, the idea. that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, and you're, um, what else? Tell me 
so they've been used in ancient times as dyes, but even now they're being used in sunscreens as UVA and UVB um, absorbent molecules. So well, right now, in, in typical sunscreens, you have organic molecules that would absorb UV and UVB rays. Okay. Um, some people are allergic to certain molecules, especially this this one called PABA, um, and that that is a. a it w it's not really found in sunscreens anymore, but it used to be quite popular in sunscreens until a lot of people started being allergic to it, and now nanoparticles actually have taken its place because they absorb light very strongly in the UVA and UVB spectrum. Interesting. What Can you talk about your research? I'm currently using nanoparticles for next generation diagnostic tests. Okay. That's what I can say. I'm sorry. <laughs> can you tell me what industry it is? Um, you mean the name of the company? Or? Uh, yeah, tell me the name of the company. The name of the company is NanoReady Incorporated. We're in Lansing, Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it is, it's spinning out some technology from Michigan State University. I know that's not popular in Ann Arbor. So. That's my alma mater. <laughs> Michigan State, really? Yeah, I have, that's where my biochemistry oh. is. Oh, well, I do a lot on campus. <laughs> do you like basketball? Oh, yeah, I do. My son used to play basketball. Really? Oh, nice. See, I used to get season tickets for Penn State, but it's not like Michigan State for basketball, for sure. <laughs> I liked your presentation. One of, the, one of the slides that you had showed a, uh, a, a cup yes. from ancient Greece or ancient Rome. I've forgotten which now. Yes. And it, w it had some sort of nano, some sort of gold nanoparticles in it, yes. right? So that, that was called the Lysurgis Cup. It okay. was from Rome. And it had embedded silver and gold nanoparticles in it, um, which gave it a dichroic effect, which means just by color. Um, and so if you if you look at the transmitted light through it, if you don't use a flash of the camera and you just put a flashlight behind it, it glows red due to the gold nanoparticles. But if you take a picture with a flash and you eliminate it from the front and you see the scattering effect, that's due to silver nanoparticles and then the cup looks green. So here's an application that apparently the ancients knew about. Yes. Is just uh, the coolness factor and just the decoration. <laughs> right? This the, is a, the coolness factor and the dye factor. And the dye factor. Yes. And so they made it look really nice yes. and really bright and different under different lighting conditions. Yes. Did, did the ancients know this about the understand nanoparticles? I or how no, they? I don't. I mean, they, they, they couldn't look on the nano scale. They don't have the microscopes that we do now, the electron microscopes. But they, they yeah, the net electron microscopes in ancient Rome were just really primitive. Oh, I'm sure they were wonderful and no. <laughs> really high resolution. But, no, they were primitive. The Mettler balances were, were good, though. I, I'm sure they were, too. <laughs> um, but they, they did know that metals gave rise to very beautiful colors and even today we still know that with our pigments and our dyes especially in paints and things like that um, a lot of, a lot of your clothes are dyed with organic pigments but when it comes to paints a lot of them are actually metals a lot and some of them are very toxic they have cadmium and lead and mercury in them so oh, don't really? eat them <laughs> so these are the not these are the organic ones these are the inorganic ones, the inorganic, ones. <laughs> inorganic ones yeah so organic things are organic dyes are typically pretty safe okay. inorganic dyes a lot of times involve metals they're not very safe okay even if they're nano metals if they're nanometals, the jury's still out. Oh, <laughs> but oh okay, if, that's an if, interesting if, point. The, the, if, we're still doing a lot of research. We yes, don't know. we are. We're doing a lot of research. So actually, one of the big areas of research that I didn't go into in my presentation, um, but was on the first slide, it showed these really beautiful fluorescent particles of all sorts of different colors are called quantum dots. And they're very, very small particles. Um, and they're typically made of heavy metals, um, such as cadmium or lead uh, or gallium. And, uh, but, you know, you, you think of cadmium and lead, and you don't exactly think the most healthy of metals. Those are pretty heavy metals and, and known to be toxic. So the, these particles are very, very bright, but it would be great to put them in the body to sort of, you know, target cancer and have your cancer light up so that the surgeons knew what to excise. Right. But at the same time, you're putting cadmium and lead in your body. Right. So scientists are trying to actually put coatings on these particles to keep them from leaching, keep the elements from leaching out into the body. Hmm. Uh, so that's an active area of research. So I think my audience, a lot of them are not PhDs in chemistry, <laughs> like, like you are. Chemistry, right? Yes. Uh, Penn State, right? Yes. Okay. Um, but I think a lot of people are interested in this. Where would, where would folks that are maybe not as academic as you are who uh, would learn more? I, I, I think even popular science would be a great place to learn more. Popular science has, has a lot of articles on, on sort of modern nanoscience, and, and I found some wonderful informative articles in popular science before. Do you have any papers you're publishing or blogs you're 
writing too? You know, Do you have an online I, sh- I shut down a blog since I, yes, you I I finished I finished my postdoc and it was called it was called an American postdoc in Canada and now now I'm not an American postdoc in Canada anymore so I can't really I can't really do that blog anymore. Um, I'm I don't have any papers coming out. All my papers are out in in, in print so. I have nothing publicized. I wish I did. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kristen, thank you so much. Thank you very much for interviewing me. All my friends who are really my friends are totally down with nanotechnology. 